Congratulations. Thank you. Um, you know, last summer, uh, you, you broke box office records with Jurassic World, and I'm just interested, it, it seemed like that was going to be a big movie, but I don't think people thought that it was going to be quite the size of a hit that it was. What, what do you think resonated with people? Why was it so successful? Well, I think that the audience um, was ready for something kind of fresh and new. It wasn't a superhero movie. And I think that um, dinosaurs seem to be something that um, continue to excite and enthrall uh, people all over the world. So the fact that we had three movies before and we had to have one for quite a while um, was one thing. But I think the key to the movie was that we had a director who was a wonderful filmmaker and equally a huge fan of the movies, the past movies. So he was able to combine his, his filmmaking skills and his just excitement as a fan. And, and that touched on a lot of things for a lot of people. who uh, They felt that the movie was true to the original movies and then it brought excitement uh, of, of the new technology that's here as well as the storytelling and people just thought, well, I'd like to go to the movie theater and experience that same feeling that I had when I was getting out of school the last time, the, the last Jurassic came out. So there are a lot of, it's kind of a perfect storm of a lot of things coming together all at the same time. Who, who found Colin, and why did you think he'd be a good fit for this? Well, it actually started when Kathy was looking for a director for Star Wars, and she had been talking to Brad Bird, and uh, Brad said um, he, he had a kind of crazy idea of how he might do Star Wars by having somebody else prep it and then he would shoot it because he was doing Tomorrowland at that time. And she said, well, well, how would you do that? And he said, well, there's this filmmaker, this director, new director, who reminds me a lot of me. And she said, well, who's that? She's, and he said, Colin Trevorrow. So she told me this story and when we were looking for a director for Jurassic, um, I just called Colin up. <laughs> it's kind of that simple. And when I first spoke to him, he lived on the East Coast. He was such a fan of the movies, and he could articulate exactly what he hoped the next movie would be. And that's kind of how it started. We looked at Safety Not Guaranteed. I brought him out, introduced him to Stephen, and the rest is history. What kind of challenges uh was it though? Because I mean, Safety Not Guaranteed was a Sundance movie, and this is a hundred million dollar plus movie. What is it, as a producer, is it more difficult to work with somebody when they're coming in and doing their first big budget film? Does it really matter what the price tag of a movie is? What do you? Well, think? it's it, no, it's. Uh, I mean, making movies, there's a lot of things that are the same no matter whether it's two hundred million dollar movie or uh, a five million dollar movie. And it's really about the story and the storytelling. And, and I felt that as long as we could surround Colin with um, experienced people in making big movies, that the talent that he showed in Safety Not Guaranteed uh, meant that he knew how to tell the story with the camera and uh, deal with the actors, which is really kind of the main job of the director. And we would support him to get his vision up on the screen on the other side. So where does the franchise go from here? Or is, I assume there's going to be a sequel since it makes yes, sense. Yes, there's going to be a sequel, 2018. And who will be directing it, have you decided? Uh, we haven't decided on, on a director yet, but we will very soon. We're just starting the, uh, just got a treatment in, and we're going to start the script process uh, momentarily, and we'll also be announcing a director very soon. But Colin will not be directing it, right? Because no, he's, he's right. He and his partner, Derek Connolly, are writing it. So would you go and do something similar where you try to find somebody from the indie world, do you think, or do you, does it... It kind of depends on when we get the script, what we're looking for. Uh, you know, it always helps to have someone with experience, uh, but I, I think we're open to every option. You, you also broke records, uh, but at your crown, you, you didn't hold on to it very long, and, and last December, uh, was, was there any sort of family tension when Star Wars ended up uh, taking... Uh, yeah, it was kind of an interesting Christmas. Um, <laughs> um, if you'll recall, uh, Jurassic World was able to hold on to the title uh, of the biggest movie of 2015 until January 1st of 2016. So technically, we were number one in 2015. 
Did you try to hold that over your wife at all? Or? Well, no, because then she obliterated the, <laughs> the record after that. So uh, it, it's a, a healthy competition. And you guys are, are coming back again with, with Indiana Jones 5. I, you will be producing that? Is that, is that yes, right? it's a, again a kind of full circle thing because uh, Raiders is really uh, a benchmark movie for me in, in both my career and my personal life. Um, it was my first credit as a producer, um, the single credit. It was my biggest movie. Started my relationship with Steven. I met Kathy. And I probably should have said that first. Um, <laughs> now I think about it. Um, and uh, um, so, in that movie, it was my first uh, nomination and my first award here at Show West. So now to be how many ever years is 35 years later, the two of us coming back to produce this next one is pretty sweet. And, uh, you know, how far along are you in the process? Do you guys have a script? Do you... No, we're really early now. This is just an, uh, getting the deals together and then we're gonna uh, bring on a writer and, and start working. Steven obviously has Ready Player One to make this summer. Uh, we have uh, the BFG coming out. And so, um, we're all going to be in London. Kathy's there on Star Wars, so we're all going to be in London soon, and we'll start the process of developing the script. How long does one of these big movies take to to bring to the screen? I mean, how how, how much work is there uh, when it comes to this kind of? Well, movie? it's this one's you know it's going to be two or three years. Uh, it, it kind of depends on how fast you can go. Um, this will be an original idea, so it will take longer than if we had a book or a magazine article or something. Uh, but we do have the character and we do know where he's coming from and I think uh, this is probably going to be not a prequel but continue, continuing on after the last one. So um, it, it'll probably take two and a half years. Is, is this a franchise that could uh, exist without, you know, at some point there was mention about maybe they rebooted, I think Chris Pratt was, was brought up. Is this, is this a franchise that could uh, survive without Harrison Ford, or is he such a part of it that, that it can't? Well, it's all about the story. You know, I think that um, both on the Jason Bourne series in, uh, and on Indiana Jones, we're not going to do the Bond thing. We, we think those characters are iconic, and those actors are the only ones that can play them. Um, so we have to find uh, another way of going. Uh, on Twitter, there was some discussion, you know, is, is Harrison Ford going to be too old to, to do this kind of a role? I mean, do you have any response to, uh, to that kind of thing? He wasn't too old in The Force Awakens. <laughs> so, no, I think he'll be fine. And what about bringing uh, Matt Damon back with, with Jason Bourne? What, how did you convince him to, to come back to the franchise and, and to bring Paul Greengrass back? What was it that, that he wanted to keep doing this? Why? Well, we... we uh, we love making these movies, the Jason Bourne movies, and we kind of ran out of stories. Um, Robert Ludlum only wrote three books. Uh, we had three titles. We didn't really stay with the books, but we had three titles. And so after Ultimatum, um, he kind of swam off into the sunset. And uh, we kept trying to come up with a story because we all wanted to work together again, but you know, Paul has always said, unless it's a worthwhile story uh, to tell, that uh, he feels like it's in good shape to let it be. And coincidentally, sort of world events, uh, uh, these big hacking events and Snowden and WikiLeaks uh, kind of inspired a, a small germ of an idea that uh, we all started talking about about two years ago. And that uh, got us all excited. And, and Chris Rouse, who's uh, been our editor on all of the movies, and Paul and Matt and I started talking, and we got excited about a story that we could tell that could bring Bourne back into the fray. So it's really just been a matter of time in finding the right story. And is, is it going to acknowledge the, the Jeremy Renner um, standalone film, or is it? Is that totally it, it doesn't different? acknowledge the the character, but it actually acknowledges the programs that are out there in these Black Ops programs that both uh, Jeremy's character and, and Jason Bourne have all been a part of. So it's all tied to the CIA as it was in the first uh, four movies. 
So to, to sort of backtrack a little bit, you did not go to film school. I mean, how did you get into this business? What, what, what brought you into this? And, and I was very lucky. Um, my dad was uh, in the music business, and uh, every summer we, uh, we lived in the San Fernando Valley, and uh, he was in the army with an actor named uh, Ken Curtis, who was a Festus in Gunsmoke, and also was a member of the John Ford um, repertoire company uh, as one of the sons of the pioneers. He was a singer and an actor. And he was married to John Ford's daughter, Barbara, who was an editor. And when I was at UCLA, I was studying uh, political science and I had taken a couple of movie classes and drama classes, but sort of as electives. Um, my parents invited me to a Barbara Ford's birthday party at John Ford's house. Now, I had just taken a course in the history of movies, so I was feeling pretty good about knowing who this was and, and who all these people might be at this, at this party. So I went, I was 20, and sure enough, there was John Wayne, and there was um, uh, Henry Fonda, and uh, all these wonderful, Warwick Bond, all these wonderful actors, John and Drew, uh, Harry Carey Jr. wandering around, it was just amazing. And Mr. Ford was there. And, um, but I was by far the oldest person there. And then I saw this cute young girl coming down the stairs. And I went, oh, who are you? And she was so excited like I was about all the actors that were there. And I said, well, I love movies. And I started spouting things about D.W. Griffith and all these things that I just learned. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, if you love movies, you should meet my husband. And I went, your husband? Wait, oh, gosh, all right. Does he like movies? And she said, he loves movies. He's a film critic at Esquire magazine. And I said, really? And where is he? We went in the other room, and there was Peter Bogdanovich. And so I met Peter Bogdanovich. Uh, he was 27. I was 20. He was out um, actually shooting a documentary on Mr. Ford. This was Polly Platt. And this was Polly Platt. Yes, this was his wife, Polly Platt. And they were out making this documentary about Mr. Ford, and, and Peter knew as much or was as sure of himself that he wanted to be a movie director as I was sure of I didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> so um, we chatted and he said, uh, I'm really excited because I just met this guy, Roger Corman, who's going to give me some money to direct my first movie. And I said, well, that, that sounds like it could be fun and, you know, give me a call if, if uh, that goes forward and you need any help. And, you know, as usual, he said, yes, I will, and I thought, yeah. So three months went by, and my dad called me in April of uh, 1966, I think it was, 66 or 67, and said, did you meet some guy named Bach Slanovich or something at the Ford party? And I said, yeah. He said, well, I want you to call him. So I called up Peter, and he said, I'm here, I'm in, uh, I'm in Van Nuys, California, and I'm going to make this movie. And I said, and he, I want you to work on it. And I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, I don't know. I've never made a movie before. <laughs> Just come over. So I went over, and it turned out to be the greatest film school experience you could possibly have because we didn't have any money. And so I was just dropped in uh, to the, you know, into the fire, uh, and I... I acted in it, I built some of the sets, I found the locations, I, it was just a baptism of fire. And I fell in love with making movies. And it took three more years, I finished school, and then it took three years, I had that, that movie's called Targets, with Boris Karloff. And then three years later, I got that call again, and I was off to Archer City, Texas, as location manager on Last Picture Show. So what was it about the experience that you liked? Why did you, you sort of feel like this was what you wanted to do as a career? It just seemed to be natural to me. It, it, everything I did, I seemed to have sort of an aptitude for it. I loved it. It wasn't like work. I would work 24 hours straight and not be tired. And I thought, you can do this. And then, uh, you know, have it be so exciting every day to come to work and so creative. And it was really... I, I was really lucky because I got to learn how to make a movie through the eyes of the creative side. In other words, I was working with Peter and Polly. Polly was the production designer. And we worked together 
and I was able to see what their vision for the movie was. And so I learned about producing from the creative side rather than the business side. So my philosophy has always tried to be to take that vision and fit it into whatever budget, schedule, whatever we have and give alternatives to the director to, to get what they want, but maybe another way that's cheaper or different or faster. So I've, I've tried not to say no. And that's what I learned in those days. And, uh, and then the thrill, there's nothing like sitting down and seeing the movie in a movie theater um, for the first time with the audience. That's unlike anything I've ever experienced before, and so I was hooked. And at some point you, you came into Orson Welles' orbit, right? Where, where, did you work on... Yes, that, that, that all show? happened in the early 70s when um, Orson, and we just made, I think, What's Up, Doc? And uh, Orson called and asked Polly to come down to Care for Arizona because he was shooting a little movie, and Polly took me along. And uh, I spent an amazing three months in Arizona working with the great Orson Welles. And uh, it was a crazy time, but it was, again, so inspiring and exciting to be there to watch him work, even though it was pretty crazy. And as many of you know, we're still trying to finish that movie. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. What is the status of, this is called The Other Side of the Wind? The Other Side of the Wind, yeah. And, and what is the status of, of that film? And I think at, at one point you've done some kind of like Indiegogo campaign or something. Yes, yes. Um, we are this close. Um, it's been out, so I can say we are uh, in negotiations with Netflix, which I think is a great place for this movie to be. Uh, it will be a theatrical release as well. Um, it's just getting the final piece in place on the rights. Once we have the rights, all of the negative is in Paris. Um, we have inspected it. I, I haven't seen it yet, but we know that it's there and it's not dust. So uh, the challenge will then be, there's 45 minutes cut by Orson, but we have his scripts, we have his notes, and Peter and I were both there for a lot of this. And Peter's gonna come in and work with me and we will cut together the rest of the movie, I hope. And the, any backdrop about what, what this is, film is about or anything like that? Oh, sure. Um, the film is uh, takes place on the last night of a, of a film director's uh, life. It's his birthday party. The director's played by John Huston. Um, and it's seen through the eyes of all of the sort of paparazzi and uh, cinema texts that, that are there. Um, at the party. And in the middle of this, the John Houston character has made a beautiful 35 millimeter movie as well. And so Orson always described it as the 35 millimeter movie is the painting. And then the, the life and the, what goes on at this party is the frame. So there's a, it, it, when I look back on it, it's an amazing uh, uh, idea that he had that is, was very modern then because the cutting and the shooting of it all is very sort of MTV sort of music video-like, and that was back in, 19, in the early 70s. Um, so I'm hoping that we get to, to unveil this for everybody to see, uh, hopefully by the end of this year. You've also directed as, as well as produced. Do you have a preference? Do you prefer directing or do you prefer producing? Well, personally, the directing is more of a personal reward and, and satisfaction because you know those are your ideas up on the screen. But it's hard and, and it's a singular focus. And I kind of prefer dabbling a lot of things and uh, not having to be in that tunnel. Uh, there are some people that can do, but you know, Stephen can produce and direct, produce and direct all at the same time. I can't do that. I, I, I've had um, now, you know, I have four movies this year, I and mean, so many movies have come along that I'm interested in producing, that um, the directing is kind of over here, and there's a couple that I'm developing that I, stories that I want to tell myself. Um, but I, at the moment, I prefer being that support system to help others get their, get their story on the screen.
But you, you expect that you'll, you'll direct again? I think there'll be one or two uh, in the near future. Uh, I've got a, a really good script um, called The Longest Night that I have uh, in development. And it's ready to go once I'm out of, finished with producing these, these next three or four movies, then I'll probably direct that. What is The Longest Night about? The Longest Night is a story, it's a true story. I, I seem to gravitate towards these, these true stories that are sort of ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. And it's about the uh, rescue, the largest Coast Guard rescue in history. And it took pay, a place in the Baltic Sea. It was a fishing trawler that went down and it, it's just an amazing group of people who came together to rescue 45 people out of the freezing barren scene in one night. How is, uh you know, how is producing for, for Steven Spielberg different than, say, producing for Clint Eastwood? I mean, do you, does each director have different needs from a producer? How do you sort of get, get a sense of what, what's going to be the most helpful to the project? Well, yes, uh, you know, each director has their own method and their own style. And, um, you know, both Steven and Clint are extraordinary filmmakers, and they, they have the craft down and they know what they want, and that's always important for the producer. We can't help if we don't know what you want, you, you know? So um, there's a lot of, what I love about both of them is they do a lot of pre-production. And I found that filmmakers, younger filmmakers, like to kind of run and gun and shoot from the hip. That's not the way to do it. The best way to make a movie, in my opinion, is a lot of planning and to know what you want because you can't come, for example, we could never have made Jason Bourne here in Las Vegas if we didn't know what Paul wanted. And so we spent a, a lot of time here scouting the strip, the strip and scouting the casino we shot in the hotel because you can't just turn to us and say, I want 500 extras in this room here having it at a convention and have it happen tomorrow. So um, that's what I like about working with Stephen and Clint. They're very, very prepared and they know what they want. Is, is uh, Eastwood, uh, aren't his days very short? Or is it, is I it love his days. days. What, what is it like? <laughs> it's, he, we, um, again, a, another fantastic story, the Sully Sullenberger story. And um, everybody thinks they know what the story is, but they don't. There's a story that everybody, that nobody does know, which is what happened afterward, how, how he was, um, how Sully was questioned about what he did, whether it was the right thing to do. And as I kept saying, well, he saved everybody, wasn't that the right thing to do? But there was a process that you have to go through with these hearings, and it was really grueling and hard on him. And we were shooting one of these, these hearings in Atlanta, and, um, we, we had a four-page scene on Monday, and we had a four-page scene on Tuesday. And as you know, normal movies, you shoot maybe a page or two a day, if you're lucky. Well, Clint wanted to shoot four pages on Monday and four pages on Tuesday. We had fantastic actors led by Tom Hanks. And they got in this room, and in the morning, we shot that four pages. And Clint turned to me and said, okay, have him go upstairs at lunch and look at tomorrow's work. I said, what do you mean? He said, Let's shoot tomorrow's four pages after lunch. <laughs> so we, we shot eight pages in a day, and we were a day ahead. I mean, that's Clint. He just doesn't do a lot of takes, or is it? No, he, he, he doesn't do a lot of takes. Um, he lets the actors go. And the actors, maybe the actors are so terrified to blow a line that they really know them. And they, it was just great. We just ripped through this hearing. Granted, it was around the table, so, you know, creatively or, or, or as you are going to uh, craft the scene and block the scene, it wasn't very complicated, but still, we got eight pages in the day. Interested in sort of your take on uh, new technologies. Um, you know, what, what do you think about 3D or higher frame rates or things like that? Is that something that interests you? Well, I'm always interested in, in the future and new technology, and I think we have to be open and flexible to that. Um, you know, it's, it's take, it was funny to see the slide about 3D today, because look how long it's taken to get 3D here today. And I also remember when everybody was scared of digital projection, and now we all have it. So I think we have to be uh, 
cautious, but we have to experiment and adapt. I mean, I, I think that my career has gone as long as it has because I've, I've tried to adapt maybe each decade <laughs> as we go along um, to, to what the audience is looking for and what the audience wants. I mean, today's audience is much different than the audience uh, that, say, wanted to see uh, Poltergeist. So um, it's, a, it's a different world out there. And in fact, I was going to tell a story in my speech, but I thought it was too long. On Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, I went to two birthday parties where the movie had played an entire year in the same theater. One in San Jose and one in San Diego. That could never happen to it. And obviously at this convention, screening room is a big topic of discussion. What's your position on, on screening room? Uh, I, I think that Sean Parker is a very smart guy and I'm you know, open to see what, he, what he's thinking. And uh, I think uh, it's time to look at, uh, you know, at audiences that aren't going to the movies. How, how can we bring them back into the theater? How can we, I'm a storyteller. I, I want a lot of people to see the stories that I'm telling. I'm not in favor of uh, seeing it on an iPhone. Um, I don't make the movies for that. I make, you know, bigger stories and I, and I want them to be enjoyed. So, you know, if there's an audience out there that's not going to the movies and we can get to them, I'd like to try and do that. Are you, you are a, a supporter of Screen Room? Yeah, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a supporter of seeing what's, what it's like. I mean, I don't know yet. I haven't seen it work. I've seen it presented and I encourage everybody to go by. I think they're here and see what it's all about. I, 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 you know, I like to look at different options and see what they're out there and then I'll make my decision. What about for people who are concerned that it could hurt the business? I mean, what, what would you say to them? Well, I think we have to look, take a look at it. Let, let's hear what they have to say. I mean, I don't think we've all heard what they have to say yet um, because there were a lot of things out there that I think were leaked and we haven't heard the full story. So let's hear the full story and then we can all make our own judgment. But I, I certainly don't want to do something that uh, harms, um, you know, going to the movies. What, I, what about sort of the, the overall state of the business? Do you feel pretty confident going forward? It's obviously has changed. Oh, a lot. absolutely. I, the, the thing that I'm a little bit concerned about are the what I call the mid-range movies, the, the movies that are not big blast, blockbuster ideas and tentpole movies that we continue to get asked to make. Uh, there's some great stories out there that are smaller stories, stories like uh, uh, Seabiscuit and, and even Sully. I mean, it, I couldn't get Sully made for a long time. Um, and then Mr. Eastwood saw, saw the movie and luckily I had his clout to get it made. But that, that was a hard movie to get made. It took six years to get, to get somebody's attention. And so I don't want to, I hope we don't see those smaller movies um, that are uh, more dramas about people um, go away. Uh, we can't just have, you know, big blockbuster movies. That's not going to sustain us. We have to have a balance of the two. Um, so I, I hope we continue to make the smaller movies as well. Uh, will you join me in thanking Frank Marshall? Thank you very much.